Let's face it, computers are everywhere. You come into contact with them at home, work, the airport, the grocery store. You're using some type of computer to take this course. You know what? There's probably one in your pocket right now. While computers are complex and can seem daunting to learn, they ultimately just calculate, process, and store data. In this lesson, we're going to take a peek at what's inside of a computer. We'll spend the next few lessons explaining how each of these components work, but for now, let's check out a typical desktop setup. Desktops are just computers that can fit on or under our desks. So here we have a monitor, a keyboard, a mouse, and a desktop. Sometimes we might even add a webcam, speakers, or a printer setup. We'll call these physical components hardware. Let's take a look at the back of the computer. You can see common connectors here. The power outlet here, and the common ports here. Ports are connection points that we can connect devices to that extend the functionality of our computer. We're going to detail about the ports you see here in a later lesson, but here's a quick rundown. We have a port here to connect to a monitor, and a few ports here to plug your keyboard and mouse. There's another important one here for our network connection. With just these ports, we're able to have the basic functionality to browse the web and much more. Things look pretty similar on a laptop. Here are some of the same ports, a built-in monitor, and a keyboard. There are also physical components inside the laptop case that are hidden for portability. Once you figure out how one computer works, you can figure out how any other computer works. Okay, this is my favorite part. Let's open up this desktop and take a deeper look. Let me first clean up my desk. Get ready for it. Whoa, it looks pretty complicated, but that's okay. We'll take you through it. Let's start with a quick tour. Then we'll dive deeper into each of these parts in the next lesson. Right here, this component, it's a CPU, or central processing unit, which is covered by this heatsink. You can think of the CPU as the brain of our computer. The CPU does all the calculations and data processing. It communicates pretty heavily with this component right here, RAM, or random access memory. RAM is our computer's short-term memory. We use this component when we want to store data temporarily. Like, let's say you're typing something to a chat, or a piece of text in a word processor. This information is stored in the RAM. Don't worry, we'll cram in more details on RAM in a later lesson. When we want to store anything in long-term memory, we use this component here, the hard drive. The hard drive holds all our data, which can include music, pictures, applications. And let me show you something else interesting. Have you noticed this large slab here? This is our motherboard. It holds everything in place and lets our components communicate with each other. It's the foundation of our computer. You can think of the motherboard as the body or circuitry system of the computer that connects all the pieces together. The last component we'll talk about is our power supply, which converts electricity from our wall outlet onto a format that our computer can use. You know what's interesting? All these components make up most computers, even a mobile phone. While it might look very different from your laptop, a mobile phone just uses a smaller version of the hardware that we saw in the desktop and laptop today. So now that we've caught the basic anatomy of the computer, we'll go over each of these components in depth in the next few lessons. Understanding how computer hardware works is a really helpful skill set in IT support. Since an IT department maintains the hardware that a company uses, a solid understanding of these computer internals will come in handy when troubleshooting hardware-related problems. And taking things apart to see how they work is just super fun. Before we get our hands dirty with learning how to build a computer, let's talk theory first. In an earlier lesson, we talked about binary and how computers perform calculations. Remember that our computer can only communicate in binary using ones and zeros. 
Our computers speak in machine language, but we, of course, speak in human languages like English, Spanish, Mandarin, Hindi. You get the idea. If we want to communicate with our machines, we have to have some sort of translation dictionary. Just like if I wanted to say something in Spanish, I'd look it up in an English to Spanish dictionary. Well, our computers have a built-in translation book. In this lesson, we'll dive deeper into how our computer translates the information we give it into instructions that it understands. Right now, you're probably using a web browser, a music player, text editor, or something else on your computer. We interact with these applications on a daily basis. They're referred to as programs. Programs are basically instructions that tell the computer what to do. We typically store programs on durable media like hard drives. You can think of programs like cooking recipes. We'll keep these recipes all stored together in a cookbook, just like apps stored in a hard drive. Now, we want to make a ton of food, so we hire a chef to follow our recipes and whip up something good. The faster our chef works, the more food she'll prepare. The chef is our CPU. She processes the recipes we send her and makes the food. Our chef works super fast, so fast that she can cook faster than she can read. So we take copy of the recipes and put them into RAM. Remember that RAM is our computer's short-term memory. It stores information in a location our CPU can access it faster than it could with our hard drive. Now we can give our chef one or two recipes at a time instead of reciting the entire cookbook to her. Okay, now let's say I want to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I see a pretty good recipe and send it to our chef to make. Remember that our chef needs these instructions quickly, so I don't send her the entire recipe. I send her one line at a time. One, get two slices of bread. Two, put peanut butter on one slice. Three, put jelly on another slice. Four, combine the two slices of bread. Now, let me throw one more thing at you. Our chef can only communicate with us in ones and zeros. So instead of sending something readable, like the recipe for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, we have to send her something like this. In reality, this process is a little more complicated. Our CPU is constantly taking instructions and executing them. These instructions are written in binary, but how do they travel around the computer? In our computer, we have something called the External Data Bus, or EDB. It's nothing like a bus at all. It's a row of wires that interconnect the parts of our computer, kind of like the veins in our body. When you send a voltage to one of the wires, we say the state of the wire is on, or represented by a 1. If there's no voltage, then we say that the state is off, represented by a 0. This is how we send around our ones and zeros. Sound familiar? In the last lesson, we talked about how transistors help us to send voltages. Now, we know how our bits physically travel around the computer. The EDB comes in different sizes, 8-bit, 16-bit, 32, even 64. Can you imagine if you had 64 wires going? You can move around a lot more data. Right now, we're just gonna stick with using an EDB with 8 bits in our examples, sending one byte at a time. Okay, so now our CPU is receiving a byte and it needs to get to work. Inside the CPU, there are components known as registers. They let us store the data that our CPU works with. If, for example, our CPU wanted to add two numbers, one number would be stored in a register A. Another number would be stored in register B. The result of those two numbers would be stored in register C. Imagine, the register is one of our chef's work tables. Since she has a place to work, she can start to cook. To do so, she uses a translation book to translate her binary into tasks that she can perform. Let's jump back for a second. Remember that our programs are copied into RAM for the CPU to read. RAM is memory that's randomly accessed, allowing our CPU to read from any part of RAM as quickly as any other part. We don't actually send data from RAM over the EDB. There would be way too much stuff. RAM can hold millions, even billions of rows of data. Despite our sandwich example, most of our recipes aren't simple at all. They can be thousands of lines long. We want to process them and we don't actually go in any particular order. Since we can only send one line of data through the EDB at a time, we need the help of a, another component, the memory controller chip, or MCC. 
The MCC is a bridge between the CPU and the RAM. You can think of it like a nerve in your brain connecting to your memories. The CPU talks to the MCC and says, hey, I need the instructions for step number three of this recipe. The MCC finds instructions for step number three in RAM, grabs the data and sends it through the EDB. There's another bus that's nothing like a bus involved in the process called the address bus. It connects the CPU to the MCC and sends over the location of the data, but not the data itself. Then the MCC takes the address and looks for the data. And then data is then sent over the EDB. Believe it or not, RAM isn't the fastest way we can get more data to our CPU for processing. The CPU also uses something known as cache. Cache is smaller than RAM, but it lets us store data that we use often and lets us quickly reference it. Think of RAM like a refrigerator full of food. It's easy to get into, but it takes time to get something out. On the flip side of that, cache is like the stuff we have in our pockets. It's used to store recently or frequently accessed data. There are three different cache levels in a CPU, L1, L2, and L3. L1 is the smallest and fastest cache. If you're interested in learning more about this, you can check out the supplemental reading I've included right after this video. So now we understand how our RAM interacts with our CPU. But how does our CPU know when a set of instructions ends and a new one begins? Our CPU has an internal clock that keeps its operations in sync. It connects to a special wire called a clock wire. When you send or receive data, it sends a voltage to that clock wire to let the CPU know it can start doing calculations. Think of our clock wires as the ticking of a clock. For every tick, the CPU does one cycle of operations. When you send a voltage to the clock wire, it's referred to as a clock cycle. If you have lots of data, you need to process in a command. You'll need to run lots of clock cycles. Have you ever seen a CPU in the store and has something labeled 3.4 GHZ? This number refers to the clock speed of the CPU, which is the maximum number of clock cycles that it can handle in a certain time period. 3.40 gigahertz is 3.4 billion cycles per second. That's super fast. But just because it can run at this speed doesn't mean it does. It just means that it can't exceed this number. Still, that number doesn't stop some people from trying. There's a way you can exceed the number of clock cycles on your CPU on almost any device. It's referred to as overclocking and it increases the rate of your CPU clock cycles in order to perform more tasks. This is commonly used to increase the performance in low-end CPUs. Let's say you're a gamer and you want to have better graphics and less lag while playing. You might want to overclock your CPU when you play the game. But there are cons to doing this, like potentially overheating your CPU. You can read more about overclocking in the next supplementary reading. Isn't the history of computers super interesting? I love going back in time and seeing how we got to this exciting point in computing. You've already taken the first few steps to building your foundational knowledge of IT. And before we dive deeper, I'd like to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Devin Sridharan. I've been working in IT for 10 years. I'm a corporate operations engineer at Google, where I get to tackle challenging and complex IT issues. Thinking back, my first experience with tech began when I was about nine years old, when my dad brought home the family's first computer. I remember my dad holding a floppy disk and telling me that there was a game on it. To my dad's amazement, I somehow managed to copy the game from the disk onto the computer's hard drive. While it might seem like a trivial task now, this device was just so new to us back then. Sure, I loved the different games I could play, but what I really loved was tinkering with the machine, trying to get it to do what I want it to do. While that floppy disk and com computer might have ignited my passion for technology, it was actually my first few job experiences that really started to shape my IT career. One was in retail selling baby furniture and the other was at a postal store where I helped customers ship their packages and became the one person IT crew. It might sound odd that working in retail inspired my career, but I realized I really enjoyed communicating with customers, trying to understand their needs and offering a solution. My first experience working directly in IT was in college as an IT support specialist intern. From there, I worked as an IT consultant to decommission an entire IT environment. 
This was my first experience working directly with large IT infrastructure and pushing myself outside my comfort level as a college student. I bring up these few jobs for a reason. These experiences helped shape my career in IT. I knew at that time that I wanted to go into tech, but I struggled where I wanted to focus my career. Starting at Google as an IT journalist allowed me to experience many different areas of technology. It allowed me to figure out the jobs I didn't want to do before I was able to identify exactly what I did want to do. I'm really passionate about IT infrastructure, but you can't understand infrastructure until you understand hardware. So let's dig in. In IT, hardware is an essential topic to understand. You might find yourself replacing faulty components or even upgrading an entire fleet of machines one day. By the end of this lesson, you'll be able to describe all the physical parts of a computer and how they work together. You'll even be able to build your own computer. Once you figure out how one computer works, you'll be able to understand how any type of computer works. Excited? I am. Let's get started. If someone asked you, calculate the square root of 5,439,493, would you do the math by hand? Unless you really love tedious math problems, you'd probably use a calculator. Well, what about binary? Well, you probably wouldn't calculate binary by hand either. There's actually a very powerful calculator right inside of your computer that processes binary for us. We've already discussed this in calculator in detail. Do you know what it is? It's our CPU, the brain of our computer. In this video, we'll cover the more practical aspects of the CPU. Remember that translation book that I talked about in an earlier lesson? The CPU uses this to translate and perform functions on our data. This translation book is called an instruction set, which is literally just a list of instructions that our CPU is able to run. Functions like adding, subtracting, copying data are all instructions that our CPU can carry out. Every single program on your computer, while extremely complex, is broken down into very small and simple instructions found in our instruction set. Instruction sets are hard-coded into our CPU, so different CPU manufacturers may use different instruction sets, but they generally perform the same functions. It's like how car manufacturers build their engines differently, but they all get the same job done. You probably work with computer hardware as an IT support specialist, replacing failed hard disks, upgrading RAM modules, and installing video cards. So you need to be aware of what's out there. You've probably heard of a few popular CPU manufacturers or chipsets like Intel, AMD, and Qualcomm. These CPU manufacturers use different product names to differentiate their processors, like Intel Core i7, AMD Athlon, Snapdragon 810, Apple A8, and more. Now when you hear these terms, you'll know what they mean. Each of these CPU manufacturers have their strengths and weaknesses. If you are interested in learning more about why some CPUs are more popular than others, you can check out the next supplemental reading. When you select your CPU, you'll need to make sure it's compatible with your motherboard, the circuit board that connects all your components together. Heads up, you can't just buy a bunch of parts and expect them to work together. There are different ways CPUs fit on motherboards using different sockets. Your CPU might have lots of tiny pins that either stick out or have contact points that look like dots. Depending on your motherboard, you'll need to make sure these CPUs fit correctly in the socket. There are currently two major types of CPU sockets, LAN grid array, also known as LGA, and pin grid array, also known as PGA. In an LGA socket like this one, there are pins that stick out of the motherboard. The socket size may vary, so always make sure your CPU and socket are compatible beforehand. When you purchase a CPU or motherboard, it will tell you right on the box what type of socket it has. Make sure your CPU and motherboard socket also both match. If it's not listed on the box, you can go to the manufacturer's website, where it usually lists what types of CPUs are compatible with the motherboard. The other type of socket is the PGA socket, where the pins are located on the processor itself. When we install our CPU, we need to do a few things to it to keep it cool. Since it does a lot of work, it's prone to overheating. We have to make sure to include a heatsink too, which takes the heat from our CPU and dissipates it through a fan or another medium. There's one last thing I wanna call out about CPUs. 
If you purchase a CPU, you'll see that it has either a 32-bit or 64-bit architecture. What does that mean? Well, we know we can process 8 bits in binary. Now, imagine how we can process with 32 or even 64 bits. CPUs that have 32-bit or 64-bit architecture are just specifying how much data they can efficiently handle. You can read more about the differences between 32-bit and 64-bit architecture in the next reading. For now, the main takeaway is that the CPU is one of the most important parts of a computer. So we have to make sure it's compatible with all other components and can perform well for our computing needs. Let's talk about RAM, our computer's short-term memory. We use RAM to store data that we want to access quickly. This data changes all the time, so it isn't permanent. Almost all RAM is volatile, which means that once we power off our machines, the data stored in RAM is cleared. Remember that our computer is comprised of programs. To run a program, we need to make a copy of it in RAM so our CPU can process it. When you see a new phone or laptop that says it has 16 gig of RAM, that means it can run up to 16 gigs of programs, meaning you can run lots of programs at the same time. When you type in a document, you're using RAM. If you've ever had the misfortune of working on an important presentation or paper and losing power, you know the feeling you get when all of the work you've done is lost. It's a total bummer. This happens to anything with RAM, even video games. Have you ever gone on a long campaign without saving? Then right as you get to a save point, the power goes off on the console and all the progress you've made is lost forever. It's no fun at all. You spend the next hour or so deciding whether or not just to rage quit the game completely and start all over from scratch. Not that this happened to me or anything, that was just a friend. Anyway, all of this happens because RAM clears its data when powered off. There are lots of types of RAM, and the one that's commonly found in computers is DRAM or Dynamic Random Access Memory. When a 1 or a 0 is sent to DRAM, it stores each bit in a microscopic capacitor. This is either charged or discharged, represented by 1 or a 0. These semiconductors are put into chips that are on the RAM and store our data. There are also different types of memory sticks that DRAM chips can be put on. The more modern DIMM sticks, which usually stands for Dual Inline Memory Module, have different sizes of pins on them. I should call out, we don't really buy RAM based on the number of DRAM chips they have. They're labeled by the capacity of RAM on a stick, like an 8 gig stick of RAM. After DRAM was created, RAM manufacturers built something called SDRAM, which stands for Synchronous DRAM. This type of RAM is synchronized to our system's clock speed, allowing quicker processing of data. In today's system, we use another type of RAM called Double Data Rate SDRAM, or DDR SDRAM for short. Most people refer to this RAM as DDR, even shorter. <laughs> there are lots of iterations of DDR, from DDR1, DDR2, DDR3, and now DDR4. DDR is faster, takes up less power, and has a larger capacity than earlier SDRAM versions. The latest version, DDR4, is the fastest type of short-term memory currently available for your computer. And faster RAM means that programs can be run faster and that more programs can run at the same time. Keep in mind that any RAM sticks you use need a compatible motherboard where the different number of pins align with the motherboard RAM slots. Just like with the CPU, make sure that your motherboard is compatible with any RAM sticks that you buy. Up next, we'll take a deep dive into motherboards. Ah, the motherboard, the foundation that holds our computer together. It lets us expand our computer's functionality by adding expansion cards. It routes power from the power supply, and it allows the different parts of the computer to communicate with each other. In short, it's a total boss. Every motherboard has a few key characteristics. First is the chipset, which decides how components talk to each other on our machine. The chipset on motherboards is made up of two chips. One is called the north bridge that interconnects stuff like RAM and video cards. The other chip is the south bridge, 
which maintains our I.O. or input output controllers like hard drives and USB devices that input and output data. In some modern CPUs, the North Bridge has been directly integrated into the CPU so there isn't a separate Northbridge chipset. The chipset is a key component of our motherboard that allows us to manage data between our CPU, RAM, and peripherals. Peripherals are the external devices we connect to our computer, like a mouse, keyboard, and a monitor. You will learn more about peripherals in, in an upcoming lesson. In addition to the chipsets, motherboards have another key characteristic, which allows the use of expansion slots. Expansion slots also give us the ability to increase the functionality of our computer. If you wanted to upgrade your graphics card, you could purchase one and just install it on your motherboard through the expansion slot. The standard for an expansion bus today is the PCI Express or Peripheral Component Interconnect Express. A PCIe bus looks like a slot on the motherboard and a PCIe base expansion card looks like a smaller circuit board. The last component of motherboards that we'll discuss is form factor. There are different sizes of motherboards that are available today. These sizes or form factors determine the amount of stuff we can put in it and the amount of space we'll have. The most common form factor for motherboards is ATX, which stands for Advanced Technology Extended. ATX actually comes in different sizes too. In desktops, you'll commonly see full-sized ATXs. If you don't want to use an ATX form factor, you could use an ITX or Information Technology Extended Form Factor. These are much smaller than ATX boards. For example, the Intel Nook uses a variation of the ITX board, which comes in three board sizes, Mini ITX, Nano ITX, and Pico ITX. When building your computer, you will need to keep in mind what type of form factor you want. Do you want to build something small that can't handle as much workload? Or do you want a powerhouse workstation that you can add lots of functionality to? The form factor will also play a role into what expansion slots you might want to use. Understanding motherboards and their characteristics can be a big plus when fixing hardware issues. Since things like the type of RAM module or processor socket are dependent on the kind of motherboard they need to fit into, Let's say you're responding to a ticket for a user who's having video problems. You don't want to make it all the way to their desk only to realize the graphics card you bought as a replacement doesn't fit the motherboard their computer uses. You will learn more about customer service and troubleshooting tactics later on in this course. But for now, make sure that your motherboard can fit any replacement or upgrade that you want to implement. So before we get into computer storage, we need to fill in some gaps. I'm referring to things like gigabytes, bits, etc. But we actually haven't talked at all about what those metrics mean. Sorry, I got a gigabit ahead of myself. As you might have guessed, these terms refer to data sizes. The smallest unit of a data storage is a bit. A bit can store one binary digit, so it can store a one or zero. The next largest unit of storage is called a byte, which is comprised of eight bits. A single byte can hold a letter, number, or symbol. The next largest unit is referred to as a kibibyte, but we typically use the term kilobyte. A kilobyte is made up of 1024 bytes. If you're curious why one kilobyte refers to 1024 bytes and not 1000 bytes, you can read more about that in the next supplemental reading. For now, here's a quick data conversion chart. How much does 500 gigabytes even mean? Let's take a look at the size of an average music file, which is about three megabytes. On a 500 gigabyte machine, that's approximately 165,000 music files. That's a lot of music. We store all of our computer's data on our hard drive, which allows us to store our programs, music, pictures, etc. Have you ever had an issue with your computer and lost all the data that was on your hard drive? Yeah, me too, it was the worst. This actually happens a lot, and you'll probably encounter it as an IT support specialist. Make sure you back up your data to be safe. This means you should copy or save your data somewhere else, just in case something goes wrong and your hard drive crashes. That way, you won't lose all your data. There are two basic hard drive types used today. Hard disk drives, or HDDs, use a spinning platter and a mechanical arm to read and write information. The speed that the platter rotates allows you to read and write data faster. 
This is commonly referred to as RPM or revolution per minute. A hard drive with a higher RPM is faster. So if you go out and buy a hard drive today, you might see something like a 500 gigabyte with 5400 RPM. HDDs are prone to a lot more damage because there are a lot of moving parts. This susceptibility to damage went away with a new type of storage called solid state drive or SSD. SSDs have no moving parts. Are you familiar with a USB stick? SSDs operate in a similar way. The information is stored on microchips and data travels a lot faster than HDDs. The form factor for SSDs is also slimmer compared to their HDD cousins. Sounds great, doesn't it? So why doesn't everyone use SSDs? Well, both have their pros and cons. HDDs are more affordable, but they're more prone to damage. SSDs are less risky when it comes to losing data, but they're also more expensive. So you may not buy as much memory storage in SSDs than what you can get in HDDs. Believe it or not, there are even hybrid SSD and HDD drives out there. They offer SSD performance where you need it for things like system performance, such as booting your computer along with hard disk drives for less important stuff like basic file storage. There are a few interfaces that hard drives use to connect to our system. ATA interfaces are the most common ones. The most popular ATA drive is the serial ATA or SATA, which uses one cable for data transfers. SATA drives are hot swappable. Great term, don't you think? It means you don't have to turn off your machine to plug in a SATA drive. SATA drives move data faster and use a more efficient cable like this one than its predecessors. SATA has been the de facto interface for HDDs today, but people quickly found that using the SATA cable wasn't good enough for some of the blazing fast SSDs that were coming on the market. The interface couldn't keep up with the speeds of the newest SSDs. So another interface standard was created called NVM Express or NVMe. Instead of using a cable to connect your drive to your machine, the drive was added as an expansion slot, which allows for greater throughput of data and increased efficiency. In order to get our computer to work, let's give it some power. Computers have a power supply that converts electricity from your wall to something usable. There are two types of electricity, DC or direct current, which flows in one direction, and AC or alternating current, which changes directions constantly. Our computers use DC voltage, so we have to have a way to convert the AC voltage from our power company to something we can use. That's what our power supply does. It converts the AC we get from the wall into low voltage DC power that we can use and transmit throughout our computer. So let's talk about power supplies. I actually have one right here. Let me show you how one looks like. Take it out right here. So most power supply units have a fan, which is right in here. They also have voltage information, which is normally listed underneath or on the side and cables like this one to power um, your motherboard and a power cable. Have you ever plugged one of your devices into the wall outlet and fried your device? If you haven't, you're really lucky. After completing this lesson, hopefully you'll know how to avoid that situation. To understand electricity, let's use the example of water pipes. Our sinks have a faucet that's connected to a pressurized water tank. When we turn on the faucet, water comes out. This is sort of like how electricity works. When we plug an appliance into a wall outlet and turn it on, a flow of electricity comes out. If we added more pressure to our water tank, would more water come out of it? The higher the pressure, the more water there will be. When it comes to electricity, we refer to the pressure as voltage. So when I was on vacation, to my surprise, when I plugged in the 120 volt appliance into a 220 volt outlet, the power came bursting through and fried my charger. If it was the other way around and a 220 volt appliance was plugged into a 120 volt outlet, I wouldn't have seen the same outcome. I'll still be able to get electricity, but slowly. This would be similar to if a water tank was only half pressurized, it would draw water, but slowly. In some cases though, this can deteriorate the performance of the device and cause damage in the long term. As a general rule, be sure to use the proper voltage for your electronics. We refer to the amount of electricity coming out as current or amperage, and it's measured in amps. 
We can think of amps as pulling electricity as opposed to voltage, which pushes electricity. Amps will pull as much electricity needed, but voltage will just give you everything. Look on the back of one of your device chargers. You might see something like 1 or 2.1A. Charging a device with 2.1 amps will actually charge your device faster because it's able to pull more current from a 2.1 amp than a 1 amp charger. Finally, the other important part of the electricity that you'll need to know is the wattage. Wattage is the amount of volts and amps that a device needs. If your power supply has too low of a wattage, you won't be able to power your computer. So make sure you have enough. This doesn't mean that if you have a large power supply, you'll overpower your computer. Power supplies just give you the amount that your system needs. It's best to err on the side of large power supplies. You can power most basic desktops with a 500 watt power supply. But if you're doing something more demanding on your computer, like playing a high resolution video game or doing a lot of video production and rendering, you'll likely need a bigger power supply for your computer. On the other hand, if all you're doing is just browsing the web, the power supply that comes with your computer should be fine. All kinds of issues are caused by a bad power supply. Sometimes the computer doesn't even turn on at all. Since power supplies can fail for lots of reasons like burnouts, power surges, or even lightning strikes, knowing how to diagnose power issues and replace a failed power supply is a skill every IT support specialist should have in their toolbox. Hi there, it's me again. You might remember me from the previous module. And no worries if not. What's important is that I'm here now. We've made some updates to this program to make sure you got the latest info on mobile devices. You'll see me again throughout the rest of this program, so keep your eyes peeled for me. And let's talk about mobile devices. Mobile devices are computers too. They have CPUs, RAM, storage, power systems, and peripherals. How are they different from a server, a desktop computer, or a laptop? They're special because they're, well, mobile. They're portable and usually powered by batteries. Some mobile devices are general purpose computing devices like tablets or smartphones. Other mobile devices are optimized to perform a specific set of tasks like fitness monitors, e-readers, and smartwatches. Mobile devices are usually very integrated. Remember the systems that we showed you earlier? The components could be taken out and held in your hand. Mobile devices build some or all of these components together in a way that you can't take apart. The smaller the device, the more integrated the components usually are. The CPU, RAM, and storage might be soldered directly to the device's motherboard. Very small mobile devices use a system on a chip, or SOC. A system on a chip packs the CPU, RAM, and sometimes even the storage onto a single chip. Not only are SOCs small, they use less battery power than if those components were separated. Even though they're small, some mobile devices use peripherals. Smartphones connect to Bluetooth headphones, for example. Mobile devices can also be a peripheral. A fitness tracker is a standalone device, but it can also be a peripheral to your smartphone. And that same fitness tracker might use a heart rate monitor as a peripheral. It's peripherals all the way down. Mobile devices may use standard or proprietary ports and connectors. You might need to have a specific adapter or connector for charging a device or connecting your mobile device to a computer. Sometimes the physical shape or the intended use of the mobile device makes a standard connection like USB a bad choice. For example, say you have a waterproof fitness tracker. If it had a micro USB port, that port would be damaged if exposed to water. So instead, it's designed with a custom charging interface that can be submerged underwater. Here are some of the standard power, data, and display connector types you'll find used in mobile devices. This is a USB-C. Next, we have a lightning adapter, then a mini USB, and a micro USB, a micro HDMI, and a mini HDMI, and this is a mini display port. Because mobile devices are generally small, and have limited access to power, they run operating systems and application software that's specifically designed to maximize their performance. We'll dive into mobile operating systems and applications in future videos. As an IT support specialist, you might be responsible for helping end users with their mobile devices. This might include setup, troubleshooting, repairing, and replacing mobile devices. Don't worry, we're gonna break all of this down for you. 
One super important thing, mobile devices can contain a lot of personal data. Some organizations allow people to use their own personal devices for work. We call this bring your own device or BYOD. You should be careful to respect people's privacy when they bring their own devices to you for help. To know how to handle these devices, it's always best to refer to your organization's policy. Next up, we'll take a look at how to keep these mobile devices running without being plugged into a power outlet all the time. Sometimes, instead of being plugged into a power outlet all the time, we want to take our technology with us. Mobile technology uses rechargeable batteries to carry power with the device wherever we take it. Rechargeable devices might have an external charger for removable batteries, or might have a cradle, stand, or wireless charger. So rechargeable devices might have an external charger for a removable battery, or might have a cradle, stand, or wireless charger. Look at this phone. We can top up the battery just by laying it on this wireless inductive charging pad. Isn't that cool? It's also pretty clever technology. If you wanna know how this works, check out the next reading. Rechargeable batteries have a limited lifespan, which is measured in charge cycles. A charge cycle is one full charge and discharge of a battery. When a battery is reaching the end of its lifespan, it may take longer to charge and might not hold as much charge as when it was new. For some devices, you can compare the current cycle count of your battery with the rated cycle count of that battery type to see how much more life to expect out of it. You need an external power source to add power to a battery. This could come from a wall outlet, another battery, or even a solar panel. You also need a charging circuit that manages the power transfer from the external power source to the rechargeable battery. This circuit works a lot like a power supply unit, or PSU, that we looked at earlier. It makes sure the input power is converted to the correct output power. Instead of using a large PSU, rechargeable devices use more portable power adapters, power supplies, or chargers. A portable power supply powers the device while also charging the battery. This might sound obvious, but you need to make sure that you use the right charger for the right device. Mismatching chargers to devices can damage the battery, the device, and the charger. A lot of chargers and power supplies use USB connectors, but you'll see a wide variety of charging connectors. Rechargeable batteries can be damaged by very cold or very hot environments. Don't charge or discharge rechargeable batteries unless they're within their safe operating temperature range. It's not just that a damaged rechargeable battery might not perform well, it can also be very dangerous. Batteries can swell, rupture, and sometimes even catch fire. Before working with a damaged battery, you should know how to safely handle it. You'll find some supplemental readings after this video that explains how to safely handle lithium ion batteries, which is a very common type of rechargeable battery. Safe handling procedures vary based on the battery type, so be sure to read up on proper procedures before you work with a damaged battery. When a battery reaches the end of its life, you'll need to replace it. Some devices will slow themselves down when a battery is getting old to make the battery last longer. If your device is running much slower than usual or shutting down unexpectedly, one thing to check is the battery life. Some devices have batteries that are designed to be replaced by the end user. Other devices have batteries that are very difficult to replace like small laptops and mobile devices. As an IT support specialist, you might receive special training on how to replace batteries and devices that you support or you might be the person sending the device out for battery replacement and then returning the device to the end user. IT support specialists often have to troubleshoot battery life and device charging. The first step is to make sure the charger, the battery, and the device are all designed to work with each other. We'll talk about sending out devices for repair and troubleshooting skills in future videos, so stay tuned. For iOS and Android, there are also some things that you could do to make the battery last as long as possible. It's a good idea for you to be familiar with these things so that you can help educate end users on the best ways to get the most out of their mobile devices. Check out the supplemental readings to learn more. So let's take a look at the back of our computer again. Here, you'll see lots of connectors or ports where you can plug in different objects, like a mouse, keyboard, and a monitor. 
These are known as peripherals. A peripheral is basically anything that you connect to your computer externally that adds functionality. You probably used USB devices before. USB, also known as universal serial bus devices, are the most popular connections for our gadgets. USB has gone through lots of changes since inception. You'll most commonly encounter USB 2.0, USB 3.0, and 3.1 in today's system. Here's a quick rundown of the different versions. USB 2.0 transfer speeds of 480 megabytes per second. USB 3.0 transfer speeds of 5 gigabytes per second. USB 3.1 transfer speeds of 10 gigabytes per second. In the chart, let's pay attention to the details. Using capital M lowercase b forward slash s instead of using capital M capital B to reference transfer speed. These are actually different units. MB is megabyte or unit of data storage, while capital M lowercase b forward slash s is a megabit per second, which is a unit of data transfer rate. People often mistake speeds of 40 megabit a second to mean that you can transfer 40 megabytes of data per second. Remember, that one byte is eight bits. So to transfer a one megabyte file in a second, you will need an eight megabits per second connection speed. So to transfer 40 megabytes of data in a second, you will need a transfer speed of 240 megabits per second. You'll also need compatible USB ports to go with your devices. If you connect a USB 2.0 device into a USB 3.0 port, you won't get 3.0 transfer speeds, but you can still use the port since it's backward compatible, meaning older hardware will work with newer hardware. The ports are easy to differentiate. Let me show you. In general, USB 2.0 are black and USB 3.0 are blue and 3.1 ports are teal. This may change depending on manufacturers. There are lots of types of USB connectors and you can read about all of them in the supplemental reading right after this video. Check it out. Back to USB connectors. The most recent one is a Type-C connector, which is meant to replace many peripheral connections. It's quickly becoming a universal standard for display and data transfer. In addition to USB peripherals, you should also be aware of display peripherals. There are some common input standards to know. Most computer monitors will have one or more of these connections but you might encounter some older standards too. DVI. DVI cables generally just output video. If you need to hook up a monitor or a projector for a slide presentation and you want audio too, you may be out of luck. Instead, you want to look at one of the following cables. HDMI. This has become a standard in lots of televisions and computers nowadays. It outputs both video and audio. Another standard that's become popular among manufacturers is a display port which also outputs audio and video. In addition to audio and video, USB Type-C can also do data transfer and power. As an IT support specialist, you'll work with peripherals like USB devices and display devices a lot. Now, you'll be able to distinguish between the major types. In the next lesson, we're going to learn how our computer initializes all of the hardware we've talked about. Okay, now we've seen all the key components to get our computer running. The last thing we'll go over is how our devices talk to each other. We know how programs execute from our hard drive to our CPU, but how do other things like a mouse click or a keyboard press get sent to our CPU for processing? These are fairly basic devices. They don't contain any instructions that our CPU knows how to read. If you just clicked on a key from your keyboard, you'd only be sending a byte to the CPU. The CPU doesn't know what this is because it doesn't have instructions on how to deal with it. Turns out our devices also use programs to tell the CPU how to run them. These programs are called services or drivers. The drivers contain the instructions our CPU needs to understand external devices like keyboards, webcams, printers. Our CPU doesn't know that there is a device that it can talk to, so it has to connect to something called the BIOS or basic input output services. The BIOS is software that helps initialize the hardware in our computer and gets our operating system up and running. 
Unlike the programs, you're probably used to running like a web browser or operating system. The BIOS isn't stored on a hard drive. Our motherboard stores the BIOS in a special type of memory called the read-only memory chip or ROM chip. Unlike RAM, ROM is non-volatile, meaning it won't erase the data if the computer is turned off. Once the operating system loads, we're able to load drivers from non-essential devices directly from the hard drive. In today's system, there's another player for BIOS called UEFI, which stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. UEFI performs the same function of starting your computer as a traditional BIOS, but it's more modern and has better compatibility and support for newer hardware. Most hardware out there today comes with UEFI built in. Eventually, UEFI will become the predominant BIOS. When you turn on a computer, you might notice a beeping from time to time. Our computers run a test to make sure all the hardware is working correctly. This is called a power on self-test or POST. And the BIOS runs it when you boot up your computer. The POST figures out what hardware is on the computer. So it happens before the BIOS initializes any hardware or loads up essential drivers. If there's an issue with anything at that point, there's no way to display it on the screen since things like the video driver haven't been loaded. Instead, the computer can usually produce a series of beeps, almost like Morse code, which will help identify the problem. Different manufacturers have different beep codes. So if your computer successfully boots up, you may hear a single beep. If you hear two beeps, it could mean a post error. It's best to refer to your motherboard manual to find out what each code means. Also, you should know that not all machines have built-in speakers. So don't worry if your computer boots without a beep. If it does have a built-in speaker, being able to distinguish what the beep codes mean is an extremely helpful tool when troubleshooting boot issues. One last thing we'll discuss are BIOS settings. There's a special chip on our motherboard called the CMOS chip. It stores basic data about booting your computer, like the date, time, and how you want it to start up. You can change these settings by booting into CMOS or BIOS settings menu. It varies on different computers, but usually when you boot the computer, there'll be a quick screen that tells you what button to push to get into the settings. From there, you can change the basic BIOS settings of your machine. In an IT support role, you might interact with the BIOS more often than you think. BIOS settings control which devices to boot to. And in an IT role, you might need to change the settings more often than not. A frequently performed IT task is the re-imaging of a computer. The term refers to a disk image, which is a copy of an operating system. So the process of re-imaging involves wiping and reinstalling an operating system. This procedure is typically performed using a program that's stored on some external device like a USB memory stick or a CD-ROM or even a server accessible through the network. To access these programs and perform the re-image, you'll need to use the BIOS to tell the computer to boot up from that external device. Now that we've learned what the computer components are and how they work, we're going to assemble our very own computer, a full-size desktop. Computers are incredibly fundamental to the work of an IT support specialist. They're used in pretty much every aspect of the job. Aside from work, knowing how to build a computer might inspire you to try all kinds of cool stuff. You could custom build a gaming rig to play the most advanced game at the highest settings, or like me, make a home media server for all your photos and videos. Knowing how to build a computer is a skill that can be useful in lots of interesting ways. Before we get started, let's lay down some ground rules for this ground up build. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. We should think about electrostatic discharge and try to prevent unwanted static from harming our very expensive components. Have you ever rubbed your socks on a carpet then accidentally zap someone? That's pretty harmless. But if you do that to your new motherboard, you could completely destroy it. So how do we prevent static discharge? We can go about this in two ways. You can touch an electrical device that's plugged in, but not powered on. FYI, you should do this every couple of minutes when assembling a new computer. Another option is to wear an anti-static wristband, like the one I have here. Let me get it. 
You connect the end of the clip to a non-painted metal surface like your computer and then you strap it on to your hands and voila, you're done. While we're on the subject of anti-static safety, I want to call out that when you buy computer parts, they'll come in anti-static bags to prevent accidental static electricity. Be sure to keep them inside the bags until you need to install them on your computer. Now, let's get making this computer. We'll start by laying down the foundation of our computer. The motherboard. Remember, there are lots of different form factors for motherboards and you want to make sure the one you purchase fits your computer case. We purchased a full-size desktop case and have a full-size ATX motherboard. On the motherboard, there are lots of screw holes which coincide with the holes in the desktop case too. You want to match up the holes on the motherboard to the holes on the desktop. Once you figure out which holes to use, screw in these standoffs. Standoffs are used to raise and attach your motherboard to the case. In this instance, our case has built-in standoffs. Let's start adding on components. Let's start by adding our components in. We'll start with the CPU, so let's take that out of our anti-static bag. You want to be very careful with these because they're very expensive and you don't want to drop them. Once we've taken out the bag, let's line up the CPU with the motherboard socket. Something to note is this marker right here. This has to align with the CPU socket on the motherboard. Also. Don't forget to make sure you get compatible CPUs that fit your motherboard. We have an LGA CPU and an LGA compatible motherboard socket. So let's go ahead and align the correct orientation of the CPU and secure it in place like this. So like mentioned before, you want to make sure that the pointers on the CPU and the socket are aligned. The easy part is putting the CPU in. The fun part is securing this. Just note that when you secure the CPU in the socket, you do need to use a bit of force so it's tightly secured in. And two. Perfect. So now the CPU is secured in the socket. Now that our CPU is in place, we need to add our heat sink on top of it. The heat sink is used to dissipate heat from our CPU. I want to show you some cool things. This part right here, this is what our CPU relies on to stay cool. It takes the heat from there and then uses this fan to blow it out. Before we attach the heat sink, we need to apply an even amount of thermal paste. Let me get that. This is the thermal paste. Thermal paste is used to better connect our CPU and heat sink. So the heat transfers from one to the other better. To get started, Apply a dab of thermal paste and spread it evenly with a flat object. Let's do that on our CPU right here. So first thing that you want to do is slowly apply a slight dab on the CPU, like so. Then with a flat object, apply the thermal paste evenly throughout your CPU. So you go halfway right here. Halfway right here, halfway right here, and then halfway right here. Just make sure that I spread evenly throughout the CPU. You may have to do this multiple times to get this correct. Okay, so once you have that in place, you're going to take your heat sink. 
and then you're going to press it against the CPU. And something to note is these screws right here, they align with the CPU socket. So that could guide you while you put the heat sink on. Once you have all four sockets aligned, go ahead and get your screwdriver and then tighten down the sockets. So one thing to do is to make sure that you screw opposite sides first so you know that the heatsink is attached securely So one thing I like to do again is just to kind of go over my screws to make sure everything is tightened securely. Great. Now that our screws are tightly on and our heat sink is secured to the CPU, you have to plug the small legs to the motherboard. This is important because this is what controls the fan speed via the motherboard. Perfect. So now you've fully installed and connected your CPU to the motherboard. Next, let's install our RAM. Locate the dim slots on your motherboard. So these are the dim slots like we discussed before. I have four slots available here and I have four RAM sticks. Let me pick those up. There's my RAM sticks. And of course, they're in my anti-static bag. Let's take them out. So as mentioned before, this build, we're going to use DDR3 RAM. All right, one thing I like to do before I install my RAM is to make sure that I align these slots with my RAM slots. So that way I'm not gonna be forcing those in when it's time to install. So if you see right here, your slots are right in the middle. So something I do is before I put it in, just visually make sure that you got this right, then align the rest of your RAM, RAM sticks to the same position like this. So I'm gonna go like this, like this. and like this. That way, you're not gonna be damaging your pins if you pick your RAM sticks up and accidentally force it in. So now we've got that, we're gonna put this in this slot right here. Line up the pins correctly and push in the RAM until you hear click. You know it's secure when both sides of the RAMs are locked in place. And there's something else you should know. Your slots right here, they're both black and white. We're going to stick to using the white slots. There's two. And we're also going to put this one right here. There you go, you've securely fastened your RAM inside your motherboard. Next, we have our hard drive. In this example, we're using an SSD SATA hard drive instead of a HDD. We just need to use one SATA cable to connect it to our motherboard. So first, I'm gonna go ahead and slot this in this cage. This is gonna vary from case to case. But this one's gonna be easy. All we have to do is just slide it in like so. And normally you'll hear a click like that. Once that's in, we just need to use one SATA cable to connect our SSD to our motherboard. Let me go and get that. So here we go. Here's a SATA cable. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect 
this end to our SSD. I want to connect this end to our motherboard. There we go, it's in. Remember, SATA cables can only go in one way. So now that we have our SSD installed, let's go ahead and install our case fan. And this is how this looks like. One thing to note is the small X. You're gonna go ahead and find a label on your motherboard that says rear fans. Not all motherboards have this, but in this example, we do have that, so just a note. Get those into the grooves. There you go, my fan's installed. And now I'm going to go ahead and attach this to the mol Molex. There we go. Now my fan is attached to my motherboard. For best practice, you want to create a wind tunnel that takes in air, blows it over your components, and then pushes it all out back. Check out how our heatsink has a fan on it too. That's pretty normal since our CPU generates a lot of heat and we want to help cool it off as best as we can. We're almost done. Now we're gonna connect our power and test to see if everything's working. So let's grab our power supply. Here we are. First, let's secure our power supply to our case. Be careful not to damage the motherboard when you install it. What you're gonna do is you're gonna put this in slowly like that. And then just slide it in. There you go. So one thing I like to do is I like to put my cables all the way up to the side. So like I mentioned before, it's not going to go ahead and damage the motherboard. So now I'm going to go ahead and start securing my power supply. It's always fun getting it. There we go. As you can see, I normally like to go ahead and start with my fingers so it's easier to get in. And then once I put all my screws in, I'm going to go ahead and use my screwdriver and fasten it. Tighten that. go. So go, let's go ahead and tighten our screws right here. Great. So now we've secured our power supply to the case. So it's not going to move anywhere. And just another note, you can also install the power supply before adding it to the motherboard, depending on how your case is laid out. Let's go back to our mess of connectors. There are a few things I would like to highlight. This big one right here, this is the one that powers our motherboard. Another one that we have, it's more of a legacy one, is this four pin Molex. These connectors were used heavily before SATA came out. Now we use these connectors to power the majority of the SATA devices today. Most modern machines today will probably use SATA power connectors for your hard drives. So it may come with Molex to SATA adapters. Now it's time for the fun part. First, let's go ahead and connect our power supply to our motherboard. So that's this big pin as we discussed earlier. It's gonna go in right here. And plug that in like so. Next, we're gonna go ahead and power the CPU with this eight pin Molex right here. It's gonna be pretty tight, but you should be able to get it in. There you go. So what we just did was we have the power supply is powering the motherboard and the CPU. So now that we've hooked up the cable to our CPU and motherboard, next thing that we need to hook up are these cables that are sitting in our case. This is gonna vary from case to case, but let's go through it. Some of these cables are used for your case's buttons and lights. So for this one, I'm gonna plug these in. There 
Okay. Okay, so our case cables are now secured to our motherboard. One good idea is sometimes your motherboard will come with some guides. This will help you fasten your cables to your motherboard so it's clean and tight on your case. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do that right here. Now that we have our cables securely fastened to our case, let's not forget one more thing, our graphics card. We'll need that so we can output video to our monitor. We're going to plug this graphics card into our PCI Express slot on our motherboard. Just like the RAM, you are going to put a little bit of pressure when you insert this in. So don't feel bad by putting a little bit of pressure and you'll hear a click like this. Once you've done it, you're going to tightly secure it uh, to your case. This is going to vary from case to case. There you go, your graphics card has been installed. All right, I think that's it. Let's cover up our computer. First, make sure you take your anti-static bracelet away. Get our case. Put that in like so. And just tug, that's it. There you go, we finally built our machine. Last but not least, let's connect our monitor, keyboard, and mouse to the desktop. So first, let's get our keyboard. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna connect this USB to the USB port on our desktop. Then we're gonna get our mouse, do the same thing, connect this to our USB port. And then finally, we're gonna go ahead and connect our monitor. For this monitor, we're going to go ahead and use a display port cable. I'm going to connect one end to our desktop, like so. Next, I'm going to plug this into my monitor. All right, this is the most interesting part. Let's see if all this works. So I'm going to power it on. I got a blue light, which is good. And of course, it's gonna vary from system to system. Let's see if uh, something shows up on the monitor. So the computer's booting up. Let's see. Okay, it looks like the monitor is receiving signal, which is good. Oh, there we have messages. Success, there we go. It's working, perfect. If you're having issues with your computer not starting up, that's okay. Check that your power supply can supply the correct amount of wattage or make sure your connectors are in the right place. Oh, what's this? None system disk or disk error. Replace and strike any key when ready. Looks like our disk doesn't have an operating system to boot into. No worries. That's what we'll be discussing in the next set of lessons. We'll learn what an operating system is and what the main operating systems are and how to install one. Well, good job. You've got your computer up and running and it monitors receiving signal. So that's it. Let's take a moment and think about what you just did. Not only did you learn about each component of a computer, but you figured out how they work individually, and then we built one together. It's quite an accomplishment. For your next assignment, we built a widget that will let you assemble a computer digitally, putting all the different parts together. Or if you have all the computer parts already, you can assemble one in real life and then write a short review process of how you did it. If you get stuck, don't worry. Go back and review the different videos covering the various components. I know you can do it. I've had lots of fun teaching you all about hardware. And don't worry, we'll meet again soon when you make it to the System Administration and IT Infrastructure Services course. Next up, my good friend Cindy Quach is going to introduce you to operating systems. Operating systems are absolutely essential in IT considering that without them, none of this hardware we've discussed would be able to accomplish anything. Tell Cindy I said hi. Repairing a mobile device is different from repairing larger, more generic computers. First, there are thousands of types of mobile devices. There's no way we can cover all the differences. 
Instead, let's check out some of the tools and techniques that you'll rely on to keep mobile devices in your organization running. As an IT support specialist, you might receive training in this area and be responsible for repairing devices that your organization owns. Before you attempt any repairs, make sure you're familiar with your organization's policy around mobile device repair. Depending on the device, you may or may not be able to repair it on your own, but not so fast. Keep in mind that even when you can repair a device on your own, it will usually void the warranty. So check the impact on the warranty before working on a device. With specific training, you might be able to perform some repairs without violating the warranty of the device. For example, you might be allowed to replace a cracked smartphone screen without voiding the warranty, but you're probably not permitted to replace a damaged charging port. If you're not allowed to perform your own repairs, then it may be your job to send the device out for repair or replacement with an outside vendor or manufacturer. You should know and understand the Return Merchandise Authorization, or RMA, process for each device that you deal with. The device's warranty or the service agreement that your organization has with the device's manufacturer will determine how and when it will be repaired or replaced. Depending on the device and your organization's policies, you might also need to make sure that there's no proprietary or personal data on the device before it's sent off for repair by doing a factory reset on the device. A factory reset will remove all data, apps, and customizations from the device. We'll talk a lot more about factory resets and backing up end user data in future videos. For now, just keep in mind that the end user should be told what will happen to their data when a device is sent off for service. When repairing a mobile device, follow the same best practices that we showed you for working on a PC. Protect against static discharge, use the right tools, keep parts organized and labeled. Taking pictures along the way can help a lot too. Follow vendor documentation and test the device to make sure it still works.